It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicholas Gonzalez, and I'm the associate pastor here at St. Andrew. And on behalf of our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Mark Rico, we're so thankful that you're joining us for our Sunday Word and Song, which is an opportunity to hear the message from this past Sunday, as well as a traditional worship song from this past Sunday's service. If you'd like to learn more about the ministry of St. Andrew, head on over to our website, mystandrew.org, where you can learn all about our in-person services that take place at 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, as well as our Monday evening service that takes place at 7 o'clock. Or you can learn about our online Bible studies and all the other ministry that happens by God's grace through all of you. We give thanks for all of you, and we pray a wonderful blessing on your worship today. As we continue in worship with our first lesson this morning, which comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, the 45th chapter, beginning at the third verse, and is the basis for Pastor Mark's message. Our reading this morning is read by Harold Lowe. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over the, all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you, will sh and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the light of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, some time ago before the pandemic uh, came underway, I taught a Wednesday night class here at uh, St. Andrew at Common Ground entitled The Forgiveness Quiz, which began with 10 true or false statements to which uh, a room full of participants uh, responded with their pencils and paper and became the launching point for our Bible study and our discussion that night. For example, true or false, when forgiving, you really need to forgive and forget. Because if you don't forgive and forget, it's not really forgiveness. True or false, you really can't forgive someone who isn't sorry for what they've done and doesn't repent and ask you for forgiveness. True or false, when you do forgive someone, your feelings of animosity do begin to disappear until eventually they just go away. Well, I'm not going to share the other seven with you, but you get the idea that the forgiveness quiz helped us that night to wrestle a little bit with some of the complex issues that we face in our lives and in our relationships. And by the way, uh, the three statements that I just gave you are all false. But the question is, well, how does forgiveness work? And how do you recover from a world of hurt? And how do you get close again when you've been estranged uh, from things that remain unforgiven? Uh, today, I invite you to journey with me on a search for some answers uh, through today's episode in that much larger story of Joseph and his brothers from the very first book of the Bible. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all the details that lead us up to these 10 verses. Uh, but let me set the stage a little bit by summarizing uh, the dysfunctional family feud that brings us to the beginning of Genesis chapter 45. Joseph is the 11th and second youngest of the 12 sons of the patriarch Jacob. He is the first of two sons born to Jacob's second wife, Rachel, the other one being Benjamin. 
He is a teenager. He is working with his brothers in his father's field, tending his father's flocks. But he's not having a very good time because he and his brothers don't get along. His brothers don't like him. They resent him. In fact, they hate him because fundamentally they are jealous of Joseph because, as you may recall, Jacob has declared that Joseph, Joseph is the favorite of his 12 sons, which isn't just a hunch or a guess on their part. It is something that Jacob has publicly made known by gifting Joseph with this very expensive, beautiful tunic or a cloak or a robe of many different colors publicly signifying his favoritism of Joseph. And that's where we get the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, which is one of the great children's Bible stories of, of all time. However, so great is the jealousy and animosity and hatred of Joseph's brothers that these guys actually have a conversation about killing him. Of course, they don't kill him. What they do is they take his robe away from him. And then they throw him into a pit from which he cannot get out by himself. And then they do something even worse than that when they seize upon an opportunity to sell their brother Joseph to a group of North Arabian traders who take him to Egypt and then they sell him again to an Egyptian army officer known as Potiphar, who was the captain of the Pharaoh's bodyguards, the Pharaoh being the king of Egypt uh, himself. Uh, and so today we would call this, you know, human trafficking. Meanwhile, back in Canaan, Joseph's 11 brothers concoct this elaborate lie by taking the coat of many colors, they dip it in some goat's blood, and they fake his death from a wild animal to their father, Jacob. These are not nice people. And yet, Joseph is smart. Joseph is handsome. Joseph is resourceful. Joseph has something about him that enables him to rise up above his circumstances. And so as the years go on, Joseph rises up through the ranks of slaves until he ultimately becomes the head of Potiphar's household, basically his chief of staff. Even though the plot thickens when Joseph is falsely accused of having an affair with Potiphar's wife. More than that, through a number of other circumstances that I don't have time to get into, Joseph ascends even further from his service to Potiphar to his service to the Pharaoh himself, ultimately attaining the rank of what we would call the prime minister of all of Egypt, who Pharaoh has put in charge of gathering and storing food and making other preparations for a pending famine, which Joseph himself predicts. And so this guy has risen from a prison to a palace. So now it's like 15 or 20 years after his brothers literally ditched him. And Joseph, who was a teenager at the time, is now pushing 40, give or take. The famine is underway, and people's lives are being threatened, including, guess who? His 11 brothers and their families back in Canaan who are risking starvation, but who hear that in Egypt there is enough grain available to them thanks to the leadership of Egypt's prime minister. And so they go to Egypt in an effort to try to buy some of this grain, not realizing in a million years that the guy they would be dealing with is none other than their own brother, who is now aged 15 or 20 years. He's now wearing clothing even better than the coat of many colors. And he now has a different and Egyptian name. What a story. I mean, you could make a Broadway play out of this. Anyway, the plot thickens even more when they finally get to Egypt and they don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them and he reveals 
his true identity to them, which I imagine initially causes them uh, to think that, you know, we, we need to be shaken in our boots here and we don't have to worry about starving to death because Joseph's going to have us executed for what we've done to him and for which we feel this tremendous uh, remorse because Joseph now has that authority given the tremendous reversal of his fortunes. But Joseph does not do that. What he does do is issue a close call to them. Not a narrow escape, but a call to come closer to him. And when they come closer to him, then comes the moment of truth when he says to them, I'm your brother. I'm Joseph. I'm your brother, through which he forgives them, he welcomes them, he accepts them, He encourages them, in effect, to put the past in the past, and he reassures them that not only are they not going to be executed, they're not even going to starve to death because Joseph now is in a position to feed his family through the days of the famine. And with that, the passage today, this episode comes to a close uh, with tears of joy, with great affection, with forgiveness, with reconciliation. As these brothers from another mother except for one of them, rejoice together in the remarkable power of forgiveness. It's a beautiful story, but the forgiveness quiz is still on the table. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you recover from a world of pain? How do you issue the close call that restores relationships that have been broken and fractured by unforgiven sin? I think there are a few clues for us in the story today that may be of a little bit of help to you and to me, beginning with the fact that as you may have noticed, Joseph forgives his brothers, but he does not forget what they have done to him, as if that's even somehow humanly possible to do. And how do we know this? Because he says so. He says, I'm your brother. I'm Joseph. I'm the one who you sold into Egypt. Which is to say to you that forgiving is not the same as forgetting. As if forgetting is something that we can will ourselves to do, as if it's actually humanly possible for us to do that. Forgiving is a willful declaration that I'm not going to hold this against you anymore. I'm not going to let this drive a wedge into our relationship or destroy our life together. And so is it possible to forgive even if you can't forget? Yeah, it really is. Another thing to consider is that uh, so often we find ourselves assuming that forgiveness happens when we repent, when we confess our sins. And that gets us the forgiveness and the reconciliation that we yearn for. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You hear those words all the time. However, are there not some circumstances and situations, even in the pages of Holy Scripture, where the forgiveness actually comes first and the repentance comes next? That the forgiveness actually inspires the confession, inspires the repentance, inspires the reconciliation? And the answer is, yeah, there are times when it works just that way, like it does in Genesis chapter 45, just like it does in Acts chapter 2, like it does in Luke chapter 15, like it does in John chapter 8. You can read all that stuff uh, for yourself. And uh, maybe the most important thing I, I would invite you to notice in the passage is that at the center, at the heart and the core of Joseph's life, his decision making, his disposition, the way he even looks at and thinks of his circumstances and the story of his life is the most important relationship of all, and that is his relationship with God. 
With the eyes of faith, Joseph sees the hand of God in his whole life, including his suffering. And he believes that God is using him and is even using his suffering to bring relief and healing and life to his nation and reconciliation to his family. It's not that Joseph thinks that, you know, God willed his suffering as some sort of a punishment for sin, but that God is using his suffering to bring life to the world. Well, who does that remind you of? And so, when your relationship with God is at the heart and soul and core and center of your life, chances are pretty good that it will spill over and have an influence on all the other relationships in your life, on your decision making, on how you see your circumstances, how you relate to the people around you. Now, having said all that, there are places in scripture where forgiveness is not given, where reconciliation does not happen. Places like Matthew 16, Matthew 18, uh, the end of uh, John chapter 20. But if there was a, a story uh, that really had an impact on my life as young pastor still does to this very day, it is the true story of a fellow pastor in our denomination who I actually know, who is now in his mid 80s, but who when he was a young pastor himself, Many years ago, like you know, when I was barely born in the late 1950s, or early 1960s, there was a day when he went uh, to attend the funeral service of a fellow pastor, a colleague in ministry who had died. When he arrived at the church for this funeral, he went in and the ushers of this Lutheran church would not allow him into the church for that funeral because of his race. Because Bryant Clancy is African American. Now when I think about that, you know, I, I don't know how exactly I would have reacted, you know, uh, in a circumstance like that, but as I ponder it, I, I find myself thinking and, and even saying, you know, if, if this is what Christianity is about, if this is what your church is about, if this is what your Christ is about, if this is what your ministry is about, then I want nothing to do with it. And you can have this church and your worthless religion. But that's not what Brian Clancy did. Instead, he turned around, walked out of the church, went across the road, he turned around again, and he stood there alone, reverently, quietly, dressed in his best suit, facing the church for an hour and a half. While that funeral service went on, until it was over, everybody came out, and he got his in, car, in his car, and he went home, having paid his respects in the best way he possibly could. And in my mind, at least, having sent a message to a church that was so polluted by racism, so polluted by sin as to be hardly recognizable as the body of Christ, sending a message in effect that said to them, if you would just come closer, you would see that I am your brother. When they went low, Brian Clancy went high. And how does he do that? He does it because he is absolutely secure in the most important relationship of his whole life. And that is his relationship, his identity in Jesus Christ who makes it possible for him to forgive even when he cannot forget and to extend real reconciliation even when it was not being asked for. Uh, years later, uh, Brian Clancy was actually elected uh, vice president of our denomination southeastern district having ecclesiastical authority over the church that once cast him out. 
And then years after that, he served from 1990 until his retirement in the early 2000s as uh, executive director of our denomination's uh, Board for Black Ministry uh, Services. Uh, to my knowledge, he never told that story himself, but uh, others who were there and were part of it have shared and passed down that story on his behalf. What I do know is uh, that Bryant Clancy, and I have heard this, uh, always began his sermons by praying the words of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Test me and know my heart. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me into the pathway of your kingdom. Uh, I would imagine uh, that there are going to be times in your life uh, when you will find uh, yourself faced with uh, the opportunity, the struggle, maybe even the challenge of being in the position of Joseph with some variation on the theme. And when that happens, I would invite you to remember his story, to think of that story and to be reminded that it is possible to forgive even when you can't forget that it is possible to extend reconciliation and grace even though it may not be asked for because you are absolutely secure in the most important relationship of your whole life. I also imagine that there are gonna be other times when you and I find ourselves in the position of those 11 brothers because we've sold out. Sold out to our selfishness, sold out to our jealousy, walked away from the family, only to be left in the spiritual famine of our guilt and our shame, holding absolutely nothing in our hands. When that happens, I would invite you to think of Jesus Christ, to whom the story of Joseph directly points, who came into this world to say to you and to me, I am your brother. I am here to welcome you, to forgive you. I am here to accept you. I am here to reconcile you because I have suffered so that you can go free. I have sacrificed so that in the famine of your shame, you can be fed at my table with the grace of God. And so with all of that having been said, uh, I hope that the story of Joseph from Genesis chapter 45 and the eternal love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ will help you to ace the forgiveness quiz. <laughs> Whenever you find yourself needing to take it once again, knowing that God has made you and me a family of many colors, who now have the privilege and the joy of calling each other to closeness, issuing his close call to be reconciled with God, reconciled with his family in the power of forgiveness and grace in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
As we close, I invite you to join me in the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.